So hello everyone. My name is Marina Bardash Nebro. I am the program manager for adult programming at Central Synagogue. And I'm really excited to bring this series, Breakfast with Israeli Women, to you um, this month. Um, this is a series that's going to be going on every every week this month in June on Wednesday mornings, um, where we are going to be talking to notable, interesting, exciting um, women in Israel who are active in the reform movement, either directly with the reform movement or are inspired by um, their involvement in the reform movement. This is part of our Israel at 75 programming um, with the goal of ensuring that our members and our friends and anyone who tunes into Central Synagogue programming gets to meet Israelis face to face and hear their personal stories from a place of similarity. Um, we want you to understand the intricacies of what it means to be a reformed Jew uh, in Israel. Um, I think we're going to learn some interesting things about the differences um, and the similarities of reform identity in America and New York um, and, and in Israel. And lastly, I want, um, I, I hope that as you listen to these conversations, ask questions at the end, make sure to ask your questions in the chat, um, that you'll be able to personally reflect on your own Jewish identity, your own reformed Jewish identity, um, and your connection to Israel and how those all intersect. Um, so now I'm going to uh, hand it over to Michal, our shlicha, our emissary from Israel, who helps us with all of our Israel programming here at Central Synagogue. Um, and go for it, Michal. Uh, thank you so much, Marina, and good morning, everyone. Good afternoon uh, to our guest, Noah, who is uh, joining us from Israel. Um, my name is Michal Abramoff, and I am the Shlicha, the Israeli Emissary at Central Synagogue. Um, and when I heard about this program, and I know that my predecessor, Karine, had started this program of Breakfast with Israeli Women, we really wanted to restart it. Um, and we had the idea of really focusing on Israeli reform women. I personally, some of you already know, come from the Israeli reform movement. Um, and in the past year that I've been central, I've seen so many similarities and differences between being reform in Israel and being reform here in New York. Um, and I figured it would be so wonderful to have this conversation and even more wonderful that I get to invite my uh, friend and my also former colleague, uh, Noah Talel, who is here with us today. She's our first woman that we get to meet. Uh, so Noah, thank you so much for being here. Um, I think we'll start maybe by Noah, you can introduce yourself. Uh, tell us who you are, uh, where are you calling from, and your um, what, what is your job, what do you do? Well, thank you, Michal. We miss you in Israel, but we're happy <laughs> for New York and for all of you that you are working with her. Um, so good morning, everyone. It's really an honor to be here. Um, my name is Noah Talel. Uh, my mom is uh, originally from Toronto, Canada, and she made Aliyah. Met my Iraqi, my father from Iraq, and this is the result. Um, I am 36 years old. I live in Jerusalem in, in Karem neighborhood, if you know, a bit on the outskirts. I am a social worker. Um, this is my, like, my. Um, my education and background and a lot of what I do is around um, working with people in different variations. Um, today, my, form, my position at the moment is I'm the director of the Young Adult Divi Division of the IMPJ. Um, that's my day job. I also have to say that I have a creative side as well. So I'm a, a conscious movement teacher as well and uh, a DJ. Um, this is general introduction. And we're, we're going to dive into so many of these because between social worker, DJ, mo uh, conscious movement, I mean, there's so much in there. Uh, but first, just to make sure, because uh, this is going to come up a lot, IMPJ is the uh, sort of name that we use for the Israeli reform movement. It stands for the Israeli movement for progressive and reform Judaism. Um, so you'll be hearing IMPJ a lot. So it's good to say it. Um, and maybe we can start, Noah, uh, because before we dive into all the amazing things you do, just tell us a bit, what is the Israeli reform movement in your, in your eyes? Like, what, what is it? 
Wow. Um, so, <laughs> just a short answer, you know, yeah, just, <laughs> just to start us off. So I would really see it today as a religious movement in Israel, a progressive religious movement that has a lot of um, diverse programming and um, is a liberal, is very liberal. And um, I would say there is a lot, a lot of the DNA of the reform movement is a lot of community work. We have today, I think, 56 communities all over uh, Israel, which is really a leap from, I think, 10 years ago, maybe even twice as much the amount of people. Um, and I'm really building kind of the, the young adult movement of also people that grew up in the movement, in uh, the youth movement, in bar mitzvah programs, in Pali education, which is uh, Jewish education in elementary schools and in high schools. Um, and also people that are just identifying with the liberal Jewish uh, values that are shlichim or people that move to Israel or lim chadashim. Um, so I would say that it's a very, very special organization. It has many people. I think today um, there are a hundred workers in the movement. I just to get a gist of the, uh, the size. Um, rabbis a lot of the rabbis are part of that pool of, uh, of manpower and they have communities around them um, so this is kind of what the impj is like technically but i would say that really the, the depth and the the identity of this this movement i feel is very very important in israel these days and in the extreme times that we live in with extreme currents and movements of the society we kind of um, hold on to liberal values and um, and offer a, an alternative of Jewish identity, Jewish practice, uh, human rights, um, and are very vocal about it in society. Um, this maybe for me, this is the reform movement. And as I said, my mom is from Toronto, and I really was raised and born in the movement in the Kola Neshama synagogue, if anyone knows, in Jerusalem, in the youth movement. Um, so this is- so, so we'll dive into your personal story in a second. I just wanna break down because you said a lot about what is the yeah. Israeli reform movement. No, but I think we can sort of also categorize it into like different um, things. You said, the first thing you talked about really is community. You talked about 56 congregations, about rabbis coming together, about having, um, really uh, people coming together around shared values in one way. You did start off by also saying it's a religious movement. I mean, these communities are synagogues. It is rabbis, it is places of service. But then you ended with the uh, political and social activism and sort of a place to identify um, a movement to work in within Israel. Like there's really sort of different hats that we can see that the reform movement. Um, and then you also mentioned something uh, you sort of gave a list of how do people come to the reform movement, you know, being born into the reform movement, coming through the youth movement, coming through bar bat mitzvah, like there's a lot of different ways and different entry points um, into the Israeli reform movement. Uh, some people here already heard uh, when I was speaking with our friend uh, Shani ben Oh, who of course is um, not a very a much older friend than my older friend, um, but she was also at a, um, an intern here at Central, so we love her and know her well here. Um, but one of the things that we talked about is that I came to the reform movement as an adult, sort of something that you mentioned as a shlicha who came back looking for uh, liberal Judaism. But you, you started, and we would like to hear more about your personal story. How did you come to the reform movement? What was sort of your stages within coming into the reform movement? Okay, great. So um, as I was saying, I really was born into this world. And um, I think until Kind of a, a later stage of my life, I, I didn't, I think, understand how unique the education I received. Um, liberal, I mean, egalitarian, liberal values, you know, things that were very, very obvious to me, very clear. Um, and then I think only when I went to a free army program um, up north, I met people from all over the country and I just realized that my identity 
was very, very, I think maybe specific or very influenced by the education and all the experiences I received throughout my life. And um, actually, I have to say that I appreciated it even more, you know. And um, so I really, I went to even um, elementary, I mean, um, kindergarten in the reform channels and uh, uh, I was in the youth movement from a young age. After the army, I was also, I mean, before the army, I was also in um, in um, program Fellowship 2000, I think it has a different name today, but we even came to New York and it was like a fellowship of young, young um, youth with America. Um, so I had a lot of experiences in programming um, through, throughout the years. I have to say that I, I really felt that I was uh, in a very protected bubble. And after the army, working also with, um, with I would say, at-risk youth in the army, with people coming from less privileged backgrounds and really meeting kind of the Israeli um, society in a very real way i felt that i needed to kind of to explore and expand and and kind of leave the bubble the sheltered bubble and it really took me to a long journey of working with different populations um marginalized uh, communities uh, ethiopians asylum seekers uh, bedouins um and i really kind of these places you can imagine I was the reform kind of sticking out in, in in this situation not very I was I was the minority I was the minority um and it was very very special and um I learned a lot um and I also felt a calling bringing my values into these different places that are not exposed to liberal and open, I don't know, uh, Jewish identity. And um, so I kind of distanced myself a bit. I think, you know, I don't know if I was aware or unaware of the, of the movement. And I went on a whole uh, journey in the Israeli society. And then I did my, my uh, social work diploma. And three years ago, after, after really like maybe 10 years, not really, like I was always in contact, but I felt that I, I wanted to kind of come home. And um, it was it was tiring to kind of uh, hold these values alone and um, not feeling the support of the community. And um, fortunately, I, I applied for, for this position and Michal was working alongside of me with the with the youth so this was a very special I think uh, story that like kind of close uh, the circle and yeah, um, I feel circle. very empowered yeah. yeah and it really is um, a home for me um, yeah, that is a um, so fascinating I'm sorry I'm going to stop you but yeah, I'm going to yeah. keep asking like different <laughs> questions just because yeah. um, I think and also, this is our first session, and these are going to be sort of reoccurring um, themes. But I think uh, we as Israelis sort of never understand that it's very different here in the States. But I mean, being a reformed Jew in Israel is being a minority. It's not the popular thing. And, and in general, uh, the way that Judaism works in Israel is um, it's more of a scale of orthodoxy whether you're very, very orthodox or very, very secular or somewhere in between, but in that in between, there's nothing different. Like even the secular people would go to an orthodox synagogue for a bar bat mitzvah or not bat mitzvah, but for a bar mitzvah um, or for different life cycles. And in a way the reform movement sort of entered um, outside of this uh, spectrum. So, a lot of what you were saying, um, and you called it a bubble, which I thought was very interesting, because uh, you really grew up in um, everything the reform movement has to offer are 18 and under, right? You went to the preschools, uh, your family would belong to a synagogue, uh, you went to the youth movement, uh, You, I know you were a counselor, I know you worked in the youth movement, you know, in um, different stages. Um, 
And it's very interesting to me that you had said you had to leave that bubble. Um, and I wanted to maybe ask you a bit some more, if you can get into a bit some more, like what, what was the reason that pushed you out of the bubble? Was it bec because of your reform va values that you felt that you needed to go out to Israeli society? Or was it because of that sort of sense of not wanting to be a minority anymore and sort of wanting to be, if you understand my question? Yeah, I think I do. Uh, first of all, I would say it's also a personality. Um, it's something in, in me that is very uh, curious and wants to explore the world. And also I traveled in many countries and kind of um, learning about more perspectives and more truths of people, you know, because I, I really, if you really believe in pluralism, you know that there isn't only one truth and uh, that there is always something that you can learn from someone else. So it's not because I felt I was a minority because I stayed a minority even when I left the bubble. <laughs> even I had to meet it heads on, you know, meet uh, people that think differently and challenge me um, about Judaism, about politics, about the social situation. So I, I even had to kind of um, rise up and um, and be a like advocate for this world. Um, and it was very important for my identity, I think, to sharpen my 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 perspective of the world and. Um, and then, as I said, I think I got tired of kind of holding it alone. And it's, we are much stronger as a we that we know. And um, there's something that you can be more calm when you don't have to explain yourself on, and everything. And you could just say a word or go to the pride parade. I understood that you, you had one this week as well and just feel that this is a very obvious thing to do you know that human rights it's obvious that this is the right thing and that you know really basic truths that um so i am happy to now be among peers and and friends that really believe in uh, the beliefs and values that i i do and um, mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's yeah, home there's still a minority here yeah. <laughs> But it's still, but it is it is very powerful what you said, and I think, um, and this actually hit me very hard uh, last week because last week was the Jerusalem Pride Parade, which I've marched in the Jerusalem Pride Parade uh, for many many years, and um, growing up in Israel, I've actually marched in the Pride Parade every single year, um, and when I started working in the reform movement and sort of being a part of the of the IMPJ. Um, it was such a difference being able because the IMPJ marches as a group. Um, in the Jerusalem Pride Parade and suddenly to be able to be there and to hold pride signs with, you know, Jewish quotes on them and biblical quotes on them and sort of having that group is very, very powerful. And, and I really felt that on Thursday, I was like scrolling through Instagram to see everyone's like everyone marching in the parade and very sad that I wasn't there. Yeah, um, thank you. <laughs> uh, which actually brings me to my next question. And I think uh, this is sort of taking into a broader perspective um, is as we know, Israel is a Jewish country. It does have predominantly, uh, it is a Jewish majority, even though we already started talking about the reform movement being a minority. Um, why, in your opinion, is it important to have a reform movement in Israel? I mean, it's already Jewish. Why, why should we even need a reform movement? Mm -hmm. So I think this is really, you said it yourself, but I think reform movement in the in America is one of the strongest Jewish streams, um, from what I understand. And it's hard, I think, to comprehend that we really are holding a small and not popular opinion and um, and Jewish movement. Um, and it, it's just interesting to kind of I think I think we'll we'll talk about that in, um, further on, but. At the moment, yes, Israel is a Jewish, Jewish state, but I think the complexity started when it was defined as a democratic and Jewish state. Um, this we can talk, do a whole seminar about like the tension and how does this work together and how does this collide and 
um, that in one hand, we are a democratic country. And on the other hand, there is a lot of um, orthodox monopoly um, in very, very important positions in the government, in the uh, in municipalities. And, and in that matter, I feel that we have, it's so important that we are around and that we are too small even in order to um, impact uh, alternative Jewish modern lifestyle in Israel. And really we feel it with the funding or lack of funding that we, we get. Everything is a struggle. Um, we have to go a lot to the, to the port and, you know, like have a, these processes of just getting our rights that our brothers Orthodox um, receive fundings and positions and power and uh, it really it's even now in the situation it's even scarier um, uh, the democratic state that the country is um, is going or or going away from um, and I really feel more now in this I'm now three years in this position and in this last year I feel how important my position is and how important uh, the work that we are doing here in order to sustain this country that our forefathers and mothers like dreamt of and we're kind of holding on to this dream and not letting this place become a extreme orthodox fascist country um so yeah it's very very important that we are around and uh, the support also from our brothers and sisters from across the sea is super important, even if, I don't know, if you don't feel it, I'm, I'm telling you that we need your support um, to fight this honorable fight together and, um, and really make sure that this Jewish state is the Jewish state that we have dreamt of. Um, yeah, so. This is my answer. Um, so, so interesting, because I think when we were, uh, Marina and I were talking about this program initially, and when we were writing these questions, uh, we never necessarily uh, connected it to the current situation in Israel and to the current protests. Uh, but I do know, um, and this is, um, I don't know if our audience know, I do know that the reform movement in the IMPJ is very, very active um, in the current protests and in the current situation. Um, I also know, if you don't know, a lot of the protests happen on a Saturday night. Um, and what's Aish in Set Shabbat, uh, in the reform movement actually organizes Havdalahs to start the protests all across the country. Um, and I do want to sort of connect it because you kind of connected it to your work. And I want to hear a little bit more about what your work and then we can hear more about the other amazing stuff that you do. Uh, but you are the young adult director and you said that especially now, it is so, so important um, and I think in general, and I don't think Central feels it as much, but a lot of the synagogues in the States are also, and a lot of people in the States are very concerned about this demographic, the 20s and 30s group. How do we make sure that young people are still connected to Judaism and are still connected to the reform movement? Um, and I think it'll be really interesting to hear just a minute or two of your work in Israel. Who are these 20s and 30s? Where do they come from? What do you do with them? Why? do you do with them? Like, what is the point of the young adult division? Wow, wow, wow. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> just in a minute or two. Just in two minutes. Yeah. Um, well, so first of all, I have to say that I started my position in the middle of COVID and there were, as all of us remember, many restrictions and it was a very uncertain time in programming. And happily, we are beyond this and, and things are really kind of rising right now and, and, and happening in a, a very exciting matter. So I'll say, first of all, that our target audience is uh, really young adults today. It's a bit, I think, a longer scale of people, but I would say that it's from 18 to 35 and a bit pushed up. Um, basically before people start settling down and bringing families because um, the needs of single women and men um, are different than families. So this is kind of a, 
the scale. Um, and that includes soldiers that finish the youth movement and we're in contact with them. Students, um, the way I think now the main programming program programming is um, towards the student population. People that are a bit older also. Um, so this is a target audience in, in matter of what we, we do. We do three main things. One, we, we do programming around the Jewish calendar, holidays, Chagim. Um, if there is a Holocaust Memorial Day, we want to create opportunities for people to come together and go through something meaningful. And, um, and we provide uh, more local meetings like Today, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem are the, the biggest focal points. We're also going to start building our focal point now in the Haifa in the north. So there are the two, two activities a, a month, which is also Kabbalah Shabbat, um, Friday night dinners, um, and the, the, the Jewish calendar. Uh, and then there are also the bigger scale events that we do a really, really big Yom Kippur. Uh, we do like a retreat with a sleepover and we really offer also a more traditional minion. If somebody wants to really feel uh, the, the, the prayers that he grew up on, she grew up on. And then we also have an alternative uh, kind of uh, course of more workshops and more creative and modern things. And we kind of, um, and I, I'm speaking of uh, like 170 young adults that come from all over the country to take part in this. So this is kind of the programming around um, around the calendar, the Jewish calendar. And we also are doing things around tikkun olam, activism, Jewish activism. And we're opening, even this month, we're opening a program in Tel Aviv for after Plenty weeks of this uh, of the situation here and people protesting. There is a lot of fatigue, and uh, we're, we're opening a program for young adults to come and kind of also share, get support, and um, go through workshops and and limud study Jewish studies from the um, to get you know energized and and support. So we're going to open also more batei midrash and and study study groups around Tikkun Olam and, um, and activism. So th that's an exciting thing that is happening. Um, so I said, um, there's the programming of the community. There is uh, social justice and Tikkun Olam and the, the whole learning, Limud uh, scale. We feel that, you know, the, the Jewish books, you know, the, the, the Jewish heritage is so, Cool, so abundant and it is should be accessible for everyone and um, not only different sectors of uh, the Jewish uh, population and we want to kind of like make it accessible for people so we have amazing teachers here uh, through the HUC college through um, we do a lot of collaborations also in the reform movement but I won't I won't go in there but just just that you'll know um, so we're going to also open Batei Midrash for young adults to come and learn and get inspired from our ancestors and the knowledge that we have received and that our people have. Um, so this is kind of in a nutshell <laughs> what we're doing. You're welcome also to follow us and, and see for yourself. We're doing also one Shabbat, um, one weekend in a Shabbat a retreat every Shabbat in Jaffa. Uh, for young adults with different uh, different people, we're doing a gay um, a gay Shabbat uh, for for LGBTQI and um, young adults. Next month we're gonna do a, a climate uh, weekend. So there are a lot of uh, amazing things that are happening, and um, I think I'll stop no, here. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's 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 so exciting to me because I've you know I've been with you since you started the position during COVID and saying how how much you have done in the past three years and how much um, has changed because we're really saying, um, I think in a way the need of young Israelis today, especially with the climate, especially with everything that's happening, of really um, exploring 
their connection to their Jewish identity because they believe so hardly in the democratic values is, you know, it's finding the Judaism um, that sort of goes along with it and the reform movement and specifically your department and what you do really sort of offers that um, in different ways. Um, and I do wanna leave more time for questions. So I'm gonna uh, move along and I do wanna hear more and I want you to share more about your other interests. I mean, you have a degree in social work and you talked a bit about uh, working with at-risk youth, which I did see a question, uh, which we'll talk about. But in Israel, we do have a definition of at-risk youth, this certain population of um, people under the age of 18 that are usually in lower social economic situations or in broken homes or in different places. And we have specific programming for, or specific uh, frameworks for at-risk youth. Um, but you also, are a DJ yes. and, and a movement, uh, um, I forgot the term they use, but can you tell us a little bit about that? And I will already ask, is it a part of your reform identity? Like I'm, I'm sort of proceeding that question. So if you can tell us a little bit about that and how, why? Thank you. So maybe I'll start and say that I am an interdisciplinary person and it took me a long time to kind of own that because uh, I think Western culture really uh, encourages picking a lane and you know um, and I'm happy to say today I just feel that, that this is who I am I have to do juggle many balls and I feel that this is abundance and um, and throughout all of my journey of the of, I don't know of the Israeli culture and people and, and the world, um, I always did many things and I always was starving, I mean, hungry for learning. If it's um, traveling in the Far East after the army, I was like nine months uh, traveling in India and Mongolia and China, learning about the cultures in the, um, in the local places and also Seeing Judaism also in, in, you know, like, you know, I, I feel like religions have a lot of truths that are parallel. Um, and I could relate to a lot of different uh, lifestyles and um, perceptions. Um, so I really, on my path in my life, I, I feel that I, I've met many interesting people and practices um, also throughout. Um, I did the energetic uh, work, healing, Reiki, uh, meditation, um, and yoga in a young age. And this kind of also led me to um, get to movement. And these past years, I always dance, but um, I feel like movement, and uh, specifically, I teach a method that is called Azul, conscious movement. Um, and I, was exposed to this method when I was living in Italy a few years ago. I lived there for a year, I studied art, and um, I'm now a certified teacher, and I'm actually the only teacher in Israel teaching this method. So I'm kind of being um, you know, a pioneer in this, in this um, method, um, but I feel everything is kind of related because I am all about people and um, bringing people together and community and healing um, also with music and also with movement. And I have to say that I'm also involved in also uh, an NGO called Kulna Jerusalem, which is an NGO that is, um, it's about the, the conflict, <laughs> the Palestinian and Israeli conflict. And we kind of do a lot of activity around culture and, um, and policy work of East and West Jerusalem. Um, so this is also something that I, I, I dedicate my time in doing and I kind of, for me, it feels very co coherent, all these different worlds. Um, and I kind of am integrating more and more. I'm doing activities for the young adults also, um, bringing awareness to this conflict and also I, I teach movement in, let's say, Yom Kippur. I do, uh, so there's a lot of correlations and uh, richness and beauty that I feel. And being a social worker, I think maybe a lot of people here can resonate when you only give and you're 
kind of a vessel for others and you are sometimes a bit passive and just just absorbing i felt that it took a toll on me and um and kind of finding my creative outlet was really i feel something that gave me energy and sustainability and uh, giving and receiving kind of is a much more balanced thing in my in my world today so yeah if this resonates with anyone i really <laughs> encourage you to find the outlets of self care and um and at the end of the day it i think resonates more in the world and you can you can offer more so i'm very happy that i'm doing a lot of creative work also in my in my job in the impj there is a lot of projects there is a lot of you know creativity coming also from the people that i work with um always knew we have the, the privilege of being young adults and being uh, more edgy with the things that we are we're creating so this is also something that i'm grateful to kind of lead um you know and not not be shy to speak out this this is the you know this is the pride month in israel so we're doing drag shows we're doing really exciting things that are pushing a bit the envelope for the israeli society for the mainstream israeli society and i feel for me that it's also a political um message you know it's not just um programming it's it's a statement in the jerusalem arena or in any arena here bringing progressive judaism is not a very <laughs> common thing and sometimes i also i get i get um you know it clashes like people write us uh you know i go back uh, you're not jewish you know people are really uh, res like responsive and it can be hurtful but yeah, even even though we we receive sometimes you know this feedback it's even more important to, to say your truth and bring it to the world so yeah i kind of feel everything is uh Every, everything is connected and and I think you have just such a beautiful perspective on your identity and the way of sort of your moving in the world of taking on the one hand your professional reform identity but also your personal reform identity and religious identity and sort of bringing in all these different disciplines and all these different things and I personally have experienced a lot of these uh, meetings together um, but I think one of the things that you also said that I thought uh, are very, very um, interesting, and we can also relate to it here in the States, is we're seeing more and more extremism. Um, and the more that we see extremism, the more important it is that we offer these places of um, pluralism, of uh, human rights, of places of conversation um, and doing that work. Um, and I think that's very similar between Israel and the US in a way of the role that reform Judaism has to play, whether it's in the Jewish world or in the, just in the country and in the state. Um, but there's still a lot of differences. And I think maybe my last question that I'll ask you, and then we'll ask some questions from uh, our audience. So if anyone has any more questions that they would like to put, please put in the chat. Um, in your opinion, because you, um, you grew up in Israel, you grew up in the reform movement, uh, and I know you've had contact with other Jewish communities around the world. Um, what do you think the biggest lessons that other Jewish communities, and I will say specifically the American Jewish reform community, can learn from you, from the IMPJ, from being reform in Israel? Um, so first of all, I I think that it's um, it's really a relationship between you know Israel and and America, that Judaism and diaspora specifically. Um, in America, and we have a lot to learn from each other. And um, so really the difference is, as we name, that we are more a, min a minority in Israel than you are um, we're in America, but there are still a lot of extreme currents that are we are all dealing with. And I think, um, I think what I was happy to see in these past months in the Israeli movement, I don't know how it is, um, in New York, um, the organization or the movement decided to be more vocal and take a stand more, I would say, 
politically or social um, against what is happening in Israel right now. And I, I just want to kind of, I felt that it was a very brave and beautiful move. Of course, it was after discussions and and it wasn't something that was planted from the top. It was really like a conversation. But I just feel that our existence is important and we have to remember that, that our truth has a place in the world and we have to be vocal about it. And I think we need to support each other. If, um, if somebody is under attack or if there's a sensitive time, we can also maybe apply pressure you know, like um, on policy and, and people that are, I, I know that you have a lot of impact on, on um, the politics in Israel. And I think that it's very, very valued when you step in and you kind of um, put pressure if there is something that feels um, not just. If it's uh, the women of the wall, if it's uh, certain laws that are are being applied, but I, I feel like we can really rally and be there for each other. Um, another thing that I feel is interesting, I understood that there is a big issue of young adults um, not feeling connected to Israel or not feeling Zionist. And this is a huge, I think a huge topic that even this could be a whole seminar. What is Zionism today? And um, but I feel in Israel that people can be very liberal, modern, and Jewish, and still feel patriotic and feel connected to the country. Um, and this is something that I think we can like have an exchange, like uh, really discuss. Because uh, yeah, I am anti-occupation and yeah i am very left-wing um but i still feel that there is a justification for the state um and we should not treat our neighbors or our peers uh, as we are at the moment so i will fight against that but i will not uh leave here because i feel like we both have a justified reason um to be here so I, I, so this this pa patriotism or this self sense of um, belonging or Zionist, um, this is something that maybe I feel we can we can maybe offer to help um, understand um, maybe more. Um, yeah, and just I think solidarity is just really it's underrated these days, but after a world pandemic and after, like I thought after COVID that the governments would, you know, that humanity would kind of go in a, in a more holistic, uh, peaceful direction, but it's, we're actually saying something more extreme, which makes me <laughs> really surprised and sad. But so, so we just, we, we need to remember that we are a people and that we, we can be there for each other. I think this is the main thing. I don't know. This is Thank you. That up. was that was really um, beautiful, first of all, but also it's just so moving because I mean I agree. It is it is um, it is a relationship, and it is. I mean, we're all part. We're not only just part of Am Israel and you know of the Jewish peoplehood and everything, but we're also sort of these partners within the same values and same movements. And although there are differences, and I can say you know even coming to central there are certain things in the service and the prayer itself that are different from what i'm used to in israel um and vice versa like there are these differences but in the end we are connected and we are together and i really think that's a beautiful beautiful message and really the reason why we're doing these programs we want to learn from each other and we want to have these conversations and be together um and i loved your piece about uh zionism um, because I do think that it is a challenge that we're always talking about our relationship with Israel um, and how do we create the relationship in Israel that I think as an Israeli, we kind of take for granted in a way. We take our Judaism for granted, but we also take our Israeliness uh, for granted in, in sort of the connection to the state. Um, I do want to uh, have some time because we have a bunch of audience uh, uh, questions, um, which are very interesting. Um, so I'm going to start with our question from Karen. Um, who asked um, about your work as a social worker. Oh, sorry, nope, 
that was, uh, she asked, yes, uh, your experience, you worked, you said you worked with at-risk youth. Um, and I think we, we, we kind of, we didn't really talk about it, but if you can explain a bit about that demographic in Israel. Um, and the question is, um, do you apply your expertise from working with at youth, uh, youth at risk to the work that you do with in the IMDJ? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is uh, this is also it could be a long one. We can, so we, can do, we can we need to do a lot of follow up series. Yeah, in yeah. This conversation, yes. Okay, I'll try to keep it um, as as clear as I can. So, so basically, I worked in an NGO that worked with at risk youth, at risk youth um, specifically in Jerusalem, and it was kind of an open house for children and young adult. It was from twelve to 25, which is um, like a long range of people. Um, people really living under the grid, like in the, you know, on the streets. Um, unfortunately, um, substance abuse, sexual abuse. Um, I was a lot in the court. I was a lot uh, checking up on people in jail. Um, it was a very, very extreme population. And uh, in, in Jerusalem, I would say what is interesting about the, at, the, the youth at risk that a lot of them is a second generation for parents that, um, mm. which I don't know how to say that. Uh, well, we Bale Tshuva are people who became religious. Um, yeah, so Orthodox became religious. Yeah. And kind of the, the social impact of that, that it's really, it's like kind of being a refugee. You kind of leave the whole life that you knew, your support systems, the people that you grew up with, and you come into a new society of religious, and you will always be considered um, new and uh, less worthy. And um, and many times there's also a lot of social challenges and um, financial challenge and. And this impacts the kids and they kind of, it's, it's something that sits also on identity. And also when people are struggling financially, they are, they're not always available to, to see their children or, or parent them in a, in a very aware way. So a lot of them kind of are curious and find their way to the streets. And that's where I used to meet them really in the streets and, and bring them and try to kind of connect them back to their community. Um, so I would say this is less the demographic of the reform movement today, but um, I really have a lot of experience working with, um, I think, the psyche of the hum humanity. It's um, substance abuse, uh, eating disorders, um, sexual abuse, that, that we can find in any culture and, uh, you know, uh, social status. So I feel that... Um, Directly, I, I do not work with this population, but I apply a lot of the knowledge and the experience that I received through these years and really meeting meeting other people. Um, yeah. yeah. And I really think we can have a whole, I mean, because you just brought up the question of Bali Chuva and sort of that idea in Israel, which, and in general, uh, youth at risk is something that is uh, very, organized in Israel. It's something that we put a lot of emphasis on and like different uh, programs in different ways because in, there's a lot of different types of youth at risk as well. I know uh, we talk a lot about um, immigrants and the, the children of immigrants um, and their different situations um, in different ways. Okay, we have so many questions. So I wanna make sure we get through a lot of them. Um, going back, uh, we have a question from Esther about again, your worker as a social worker. Um, and her question is, um, working with women who live a life that is very different from yours. Did you ever work as a social worker with the ultra Orthodox, the religious communities, uh, communities that sort of challenged your values and your perspective and sort of how, how, how was like, what did you do with it? In a way? Um, so yes, um, in this former job that I was working in for four years, um, I met a lot of, also the staff that I was working with were a lot of Chabad, Chabad women and the children that used to arrive. And I have to say that 
sometimes not being part of that uh, movement made um, made me more like invited more interaction with the kids. You know, they felt more comfortable with me. They felt like I'm an ally because I, I don't judge and I'm not from that world. So in many, many occasions, it was actually very, a very positive thing. Um, and I think in the end of the day, when you meet people in their, you know, in their weak places and, and really go through something meaningful, um, that was also like a service in, in a very non-direct way to my uh, reform identity because they're like oh you're not that bad actually I remember I had a conversation with uh, one of my one of my youths that was in, in jail he's like I can't believe I'm calling you you're reformed you're a vegetarian but <laughs> I'm calling you every week you know because yeah at the end of the day we are people and if the, the love is there and the care is there then then it kind of uh, you know uh, melts all of the, the walls it's, it's a cliche but it's true it's beautiful I mean it really is beautiful and it's, it really is about human connection and we, we forget that sometimes because we're so in our big ideas and our big opinions uh we have here another question uh from Apala who asks um if you see any young people who are raised in more traditional religious backgrounds who are looking for more liberal religious spaces after coming out of the army is like I think specifically and uh Paula if you would like to correct me here uh, is a question of the army and sort of experiences of the army. Do you, in your professional experience, do you see that it makes people sort of search for more liberal, pluralistic spaces? You mean after being in army service? Yes, yes. Um, so the army is also a very orthodox organization, I have to say. And I was an officer uh, in the education corps, so I was three years in army service and um, the rabbis, the kosher, the people checking, the mishkichim, checking that everything is kosher, everyone comes from a very orthodox background. So I actually feel that maybe the direction is the opposite. People that arrive and maybe they come from secular backgrounds, they only see one stream or one movement of Judaism, which is the orthodox and maybe find, I don't know, meaning in, in that, but it's not that it's um, accessible in the army uh, reform, like the reform identity. So uh, that's what that's really my personal opinion. But I'm 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 not sure, and I haven't met many soldiers that came out and they're like, oh, we're looking for mm -hmm. uh, liberal platforms. No. No. And I think, I think maybe uh, it comes sort of with our perception of the army, you know, in Israel, everyone goes into the army when they're 18 or 19 um, and do different things and, and uh, meet different, really, I think I grew up in Tel Aviv and for me going into the army was the first time I really met the Israeli population, right? Like meeting people from all around the country and all different places. Um, so it was less of a Jewish journey. It was more of an Israeli journey. Um, if that makes sense. So, um, but I do want to go back to the question to sort of the, the first part, because not necessarily relating to the army, but yes, do you see a lot of um, people in the young adult division and the IMPJ that grew up with religious backgrounds and were sort of in this journey, or is that not something that we see a lot? So I say that I, I do, I do meet these cases every now and then. It could be also people that that are part of the LGBTQI um, community and they are disowned by their families. So they're looking for a place that they can practice their Jewish religion, you know, and, and not be judged and be accepted. So I feel like in those realms, we, we can be really a, a home to many people. Um, Sometimes, I, I don't know, if they, they know that I'm a social worker, but I, I receive a lot of uh, Haredi um, people that are, le that are leaving um, their, religious, uh, their religious practice and looking for maybe a home in the reform movement. But as I said, it's kind of, um, it feels like a very big leap also because it's just, you know, they call from 
an unidentified number because it's really a sin to kind of, you know, it, 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 even better to be a secular Jew in Israel than to be a reformed Jew. So a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of fear around reaching out to the reform movement. And uh, many times there needs to be an, a process of, of kind of, uh, and there are organizations that do that, that they help people transition and kind of, it's again, it's being like a refugee, like leaving all the world that you knew, all of the, your support system and being disowned by your society and your family. So many times I don't feel that the reform movement is the direct, you know, um, step after leaving the Orthodox or the ultra Orthodox world. But many, many conversations I do have and I, I kind of connect them to these organizations. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, and I think this is sort of, um, it opens the door into a lot of what we're going to see in this series. And I know you actually know a lot of the women that are coming and are going to be next because unfortunately the reform movement in Israel is very small and we kind of all know each other. Um, but there are a lot of different stories and a lot of different ways that you sort of become and join within. Uh, but I do think, and, uh, one of the things that you said, um, is that the reform movement is considered worse than being secular by the orthodoxy in Israel. And I think that is such an interesting point of, of how the reform movement specifically in Israel is sort of viewed. Um, and into that, how important the work that you are doing, both um, in the reform movement and outside of the reform movement, just, and I think sometimes we say, you know, just being in an Israeli space and identifying as a reformed Jew is a political activist, you know, sort of situation because you're bringing that voice in and having that conversation in. Um, and I see we have um, we have a last question, but it's time for us, unfortunately, to end. Um, I do want Vlad to just reference um, uh, 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 as a way for Jewish women to make their voices heard. Is there a reform movement a way for Jewish women to make their voices heard? Um, I think in general, women can make their voices um, heard in many, many spaces, but we do know that uh, specifically Iraq, the Israeli Reform Action Center, does do a lot of lawsuits in helping um, ultra-Orthodox women in their different fights for public spaces in the ultra-Orthodox word, but that is a whole, again, other seminar, and I would recommend we have had Oli uh, Eris Lachowski the director of Iraq at Central several times, and we have some recordings of her. So I'm happy to also share that and have those conversations. Uh, but unfortunately, our time is running up, um, and I want to thank you so much, uh, Noah, for coming in. I know it's your afternoon, but joining us this morning and sharing your story um, and sort of opening our eyes to um, a your personal experience, but also starting our conversation within um, meeting the IMPJ and meeting Reform Judaism in Israel. Uh, we wanna thank you so much for all the work that you do uh, on behalf of the movement um, and on behalf of uh, Reform Judaism. Um, and of course, I wanna thank, I wanna thank Marina, uh, my partner in this program and Rabbi Sarah Berman from the adult um, education department and sort of bringing all this. I also wanna thank our predecessors who created this amazing program and what an honor it is for us to be able to continue it and bring more Israeli women to have breakfast with. Uh, we will be uh, meeting now every Wednesday morning at 8.30 and we hope to see you all again next week. Our friend Anat Manilevich will be coming up. Uh, she actually has a similar story to Noah but she took it in a very different direction in her professional life. So it'll be very interesting to see uh, the differences in the, in the similarities. Uh, so thank you all. Have a wonderful if day. If I can just yeah. say also thank yes. you. Thank you for everyone for, for listening. And I'm sorry that we couldn't answer everyone's questions. And um, Central Synagogue is a very, very big um, partner in, uh, in IMPJ. And we really want to thank you for this beautiful partnership. And anything that you want to think about together, this is like a, an invitation to keep the conversation going. You're welcome to contact me. I can leave my uh, information with Michal and uh, Marina. And I just wanted to say it's been a big honor for me. So thank you for your time and um, have a great, great day. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. No, have a wonderful day, everyone.